Hey everyone, I hope you had a great day. Today we are looking at some new malicious compliance stories. I hope you enjoy them. If you like the video, don't forget to hit the like button. It really helps. And now let's start with the first story, shall we? The first story is called Changing the HOA for Good. My wife and I moved into a 64 townhome community that was 10 years old at the time. The HOA board was comprised of five members that were original homeowners when the community started. And they had been the sole board members since the community started. Their sense of entitlement was crazy. They thrived on the quarterly walkthrough of the neighborhood as they would write up every single home for some kind of violation. Regardless of how minor the offenses were, everyone gets a violation letter. Our first letter, the first month living there, was that our garage door paint was starting to peel. It was a 2cm scrape where the panels met. It needed to be repainted. The siding needed to be power washed as there was a patch of green moss behind a bush. And the sliding door on the deck was dirty. There was dirt on the bottom of the door from recent rain and it needed to be washed. We had 30 days to fix the issues or beginning accruing a fee of $25 a day until they are resolved. I asked around and everyone gets these ridiculously petty letters every quarter. No matter what you did to maintain your townhome, you were going to get a letter about something. As this was going on, none of the major items in the neighborhood that needed to be fixed were addressed. After a decade since the construction, the ground had settled unevenly. Many homes had standing water issues where it wouldn't rain after a storm. The rainwater would sit for 5-7 to seven days in people's lawns. And, more importantly, there had been a legal fight with the town. Since the community was started, our road was dedicated, meaning the town was responsible for snow removal. Our HOA dues included paying for our own snow removal, which we shouldn't have to. And we were paying an attorney for 10 years to fight this, with no resolution in sight. Fast forward 2 years and a few of us had enough and decided to band together to replace the board at the next annual meeting. The existing board got wind of this. They hit us all with pages worth of issues with our properties. And if you have outstanding issues, you are not in a good standing with the community. Thus, you cannot run for a board position or even vote for those running. This petty move brought the community even closer. And we all spent the weekend before the meeting helping each other clean out their HOA honey-do lists. We took pictures and documented everything. Then we had the US mail certified delivery of each package with the completed list and photos to the HOA board who lived 75 feet away. Come board night, oddly enough, the lawyer was there to give an update that no progress has been made with the township on our dedicated road. He stuck around as we moved to the elections for the next board. We brought our signed petitions to add our names to the ballot. The board says we are not eligible as we all have outstanding issues with our property. We call their bluff with our receipts from the post office that they received our completed list with documentation. They reply that they haven't reviewed them yet. We tell them that's not our problem and we are in good standing. The lawyer overhearing this states that we are eligible to be on the ballot if we can confirm the issue with our homes were resolved prior to the meeting. The HOA president glares at the lawyer, but the lawyer just shrugs saying the rules are the rules. With the exception of the five existing board members voting for themselves or each other, we are voted in nearly unanimously to replace them. I led the revolution because I was tired of the petty things when there were real problems in the neighborhood. Sadly, the rest of the elected board members want me as president. I have no idea what I'm doing. But we spent the next few sessions removing all the dump violations from most of the neighbors. We went through the bylaws to really focus on what's important. And next, ends up that lawyer was a friend of the previous president. So he was in no hurry to resolve anything as he was enjoying our excessive bill. I notify him if it's not resolved in the next 6 months, we are finding new representation. He was actually good at his job when pressed to do it. He won the case, the town appealed and tried to drag it out. He fast tracked the appeal as it had been going on for 10 years and we won the appeal too. The town dedicated our road, then the lawyer pressed that it should have been done years ago. It wasn't him slowing things down, but the town. He ends up getting us a settlement from the judge for back pay on us paying for snow removal that the town was responsible for. We ended up using that settlement to have French strands installed across much of the community to clear the standing water issues. 
With the money left over, we fixed a lot of the neighborhood issues that the HOA should have been doing the whole time. Fences and sidewalks in disrepair replaced, dead trees and shrubs and so on. It was great getting all that done without having to hit our capital reserve fund. I remained president until we moved a few years ago. Our family began to outgrow the townhome. Now we live in a new, larger development with a new HOA. I was asked to run for a position on it. I replied, not a chance, but I will lead a coup if I need to. The next story is called, avoid such mistakes in the future. I work as a safety consultant with a certification we'll call job security. For certain potentially hazardous work activities, a custom safety plan must be approved by someone with a job security certification. Since getting this certification is a surprise, very lengthy and expensive process, most companies with under 1000 employees don't employ anyone with this certification. They just hire someone to do it for them. Due to me charging by the hour, the majority of such plans are 95% finished. They include either a blank chapter labeled your stuff here or an appendix with the same name. Often they include either most or all of the proper precautions. While job security is expensive, the answers can be pretty similar between similar jobs. Let's start with the events 8 weeks before today. I got a very standard email from our family planner who has sent me a dozen plans. It's a very standard request to check and append a very standard safety plan for a reasonably standard job. So I give a very standard, I'll have it done in 2 weeks reply. Almost instantly my phone rings, so I give half of my standard answer before being cut off by a very angry project lead. I can't take 2 weeks to do this, they need it tomorrow. Now this happens a lot, either due to bad planning on their part, unfamiliarity with the rules or just the ever present requirement changes. Most people tend to ask nicely. And I politely inform them of my rush job pricing and they always agree because everyone else also charges more for rush work. And delays cost a lot more than what I charge. But none of that matters because it's obviously my fault. It's one half of one little chapter and it shouldn't take more than an hour. In the background I hear the planner mentioning that I would have to first read all the survey reports and test results. I like him. But no, I'm a professional, I should know my stuff. Well, I am, even if I can't read 600 pages of reports in 30 minutes. But at rush job pricing I have no issues working late, so I promise to get it tomorrow afternoon. But no, that's not good enough. He has tomorrow off. So I have to not only do my work and sign it, I need to finish the safety plan and send it to them. Now you might have noticed that he just asked me, not one of his employees, to write down stuff they are going to have to do and pay for. And all of that without anyone in the company reviewing it or providing any input. The moment that plan is approved, it becomes part of not just the contract, but part of the permits as well. Breaking this plan means you are breaking the law and are technically a criminal. So I immediately tell him he needs to agree in writing and start typing up a cover myself email outlining this and my fee. He replies with the words, yes, yes, fine, and send it to this email address. And then I notice something very interesting. This very standard job is really not that standard at all. What appears to be a very standard trench by a standard road apparently crosses an old gas station. This is not so much rustic meadow with flowers and butterflies as toxic waste dam with glowing green puddles and two headed animal carcasses. Now, because as pointed out, I'm a professional, I immediately email the planner and give them a call to inform them this is really not so standard. Yes, he knows. Yes, he told project lead, who said it was my job to fix that. I call the project lead again. Yes, he very loudly confirms, it's my job to fix this. So I fix it, and as requested, I send it to the permits department, CCing planner and supervisor and their boss. There are lots of things you can do to reduce costs in a situation like this. Take more samples to more accurately find the polluted spot, so you don't need to use safety precautions for as big of an area. You can use different work methods that don't involve getting yourself dirty. You can maybe dig around it or even stay above it. A little planning can save everyone a lot of money. Or if they can make it a change order, even make some money. But I included none of that since it wasn't discussed. I included all the precautions for a huge area, for standard working conditions, where everyone was all the PPE anywhere near the work site. Massive amounts of very expensive soil needs to be isolated and disposed. 
It was a very expensive set of over-the-top measures, but exactly what the book demands. Six weeks later, two weeks before today, the safety plan got approved. The permit is in the mail. Everyone is happy, because the work can start. Yay! Two weeks later, the planner calls me. To discuss the safety plan and any improvements, read to gossip and to discuss some large upcoming work. Apparently, the project lead took it upon himself to save some money after all. He got the work done to determine the size of the pollution and some other basic measures. And then they decided to just go and do what they thought was fine. And let's be clear, it was totally fine and 100% safe and sound. Nobody was ever in any physical danger. But the inspector of the government agency disagreed. Like all health and safety inspectors, they are robots sent from the future to assess your paperwork and don't care for the real world situation. They looked at the permit, saw that it listed a 600 meter stretch of work to be carried out in moon suits and respirators. They looked up and saw people working in their jeans and jackets. While perfectly safe, since it wasn't dangerous there, this did not match the paperwork they had. And the paperwork is God. The paperwork says this is dangerous, so it is. The paperwork says to wear a suit, so you must. If you are not, you are breaking the law. The work was stopped until the situation in real life once more resembled the paperwork. That took a week and an official warning was issued. Now, while a week's unpaid delay is quite bad for a company, an official warning is worse. Companies with an official warning are basically regarded as career criminals who are guilty until proven innocent. Within those two weeks, every single one of the dozen or so work sites was inspected. And as anyone in construction may know, if an inspector wants to find a fault, they will. And each one of those faults needs fixing, and an explanation must be found. No. But messed up despite knowing better isn't an explanation. Improvement plans need to be made and must be followed. And you need to prove you did so. And then you have a record of the inspectors finding 10 faults in 2 weeks, which looks really bad on your record. Now the project lead hates my guts. But apparently one point of the inspection was that all the safety plans, mostly mine, passed with flying colors. The project lead's boss was quite happy with me. Happy enough that he even forwarded the compliment and told the planner to ask me to help them avoid such mistakes in the future. The last story is called Be careful what you order your staff to do. I exclusively ride motorbikes as I don't have a car license. I worked at a company that held a yearly sales briefing that was mandatory for any team that was related to, even in the slightest, the sales process. I was in one of these peripheral teams. On the morning of the meeting, which is held in the same town as her work and around 40 minutes drive from home, I had to go pick up fuel before coming to work. When I get to the station, I notice the engine is getting far too hot. I look down and see the bike is leaking coolant all over the road. So I walk the bike to the side of the road and start letting it cool. I call up HR and make them aware of the issue. I have an unused holiday, please use it to cover my hours. I also fire emails off to my boss and HR and send my boss a text. I get on the phone and get talking to my normal garage. They say that they can pick me up from home around 11, it's now 7.30. I say fine, I'll take the bus to them, drop the keys off and head home. As I'm about to leave, my boss rings me and says I have to attend today or else face the consequences. I explain that I can't make it due to the issues. The only option I have is to ride the bike to the garage, which is very dangerous for it and me. He just tells me to turn up and hangs up. I ring HR and they say they will talk to him. Around 15 minutes later, they ring back and say, no, I have to turn up, no matter the cost or risk. I ask them to put that in writing and also say that if I damage my kid in the process, they will pay. They reluctantly agree and I say, great, yes HR director, I'll do my best to get there. Not only after the email came true. So it's a 6 miles ride to the bike shop. I fire up the bike and leg in there, overheating the engine to the point it ceased. I drop it off. I also asked them to fix any issue with the bike that could possibly come from the trip here, would I wink. He tells me, sure, I'll be extra vigilant for any damage. And with that, he sends me on my way. Now by this point, it's 9.45 and I'm boiling hot and sweaty as heck. I realize I can't go home to change. So I get to the train from my city to the town I work in, just in time for the start of the sales meeting. 
On the way, someone carelessly knocks my bike helmet off the luggage and cracks it. I get to the venue in full bike gear. Boots, trousers, jacket, carrying my gloves, broken helmet, backpack. I stink of sweat, am peeved off and annoyed. The HR director walked up and asked me what the heck I'm playing at and why I'm not in a business suit. This is in the lobby of a hotel with all the other stuff milling around. So I say with a loud, angry voice, gee, I don't know. Maybe my bike broke down and needs serious repairs. Maybe I've had some idiot smash my helmet. Maybe I had a knobhead of the manager tell me I had to turn up to a meeting to watch the sales team congratulate themselves. Maybe it's because I'm going to sit there and do nothing and I could have been fixing my bike. I stormed off the meeting room, stripped out of my bike gear and sat down in service throughout the entire meeting, daydreaming of going home. As soon as it finished, I got up and left, literally walking past everyone and ignoring the lot of them. I ended up calling in sick for the rest of the week as I caught a fever and couldn't care less for work. My doctor said my stress wasn't helping. During that week, the bike shop said that the bike would cost around 3000 pound to fix. This included a new engine, gearbox, chain and sprockets, both tires and new rear wheel. So I asked them to send me an itemized bill and reasoning, which they dutifully did. I forwarded it to HR along with my receipt for new bike gear as pretty much all of mine was ruined. HR sends a curt email back asking why are you telling us. These are your builds. So I attached the email from the HR director, saying they would cover all costs incurred if my bike or I were damaged or hurt post breakdown getting it to the job. I told them since none of the damage would have occurred if I had let them pick up the bike and let me have the day off, it's all on them. I said if you refuse, I will go to a solicitor and get them to look into it. Well, after a two hour marathon meeting, my manager argued I knew the meeting was on and should have alternated my arrangement in place. We were in an open plan office. I loudly say, so, you told me to walk or ride a bike you knew to be dangerous down a busy main road? Are you serious? Are you even aware of how dangerous that is? Remember, it had leaking coolant all over it. HR told me to go home as things were stressed. Which I did, and the next day we all had a meeting where they basically caved. The HR lady revealed that they asked the company solicitor after I left. They basically told them that they agreed to pay the costs and damage. If they back out, they would have a hard time defending it if I went to a solicitor as they knew the damage to the bike before they told me to ride it and what could have happened. So yeah, moral of the story. Be careful what you order your staff to do. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. Let me know what you think about the stories in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.